Good morning, friends. My name is Claire. I serve on staff here at the church and with some of our youth girls on Wednesday night. I'm going to be reading a portion of today's text. Um, We're going to begin reading in Acts chapter 22, starting in verse 1. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed towards Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. This is the word of the Lord. I want to share a couple of things with you before I get started this morning. The first is uh, I want to thank uh, each of you who support the mission and ministry of this church. Uh, I heard this week, uh, it was a a man, not this week, uh, past week, uh, a man in our community came to me, and he was uh, just thanking us. He was like, hey, I hear all the time about Cross Community and the people that you are helping in this community. And, uh, of course, I thanked him for sharing that, and, you know, Obviously, that's a result of the generosity of people who give here the heart that you have for the Lord and for this community. But he asked me a second question. He was like, how in the world do you find out about all of these needs? Like all, you know, people from um, foster care to families who have lost jobs or, you know, anyone in between. How do you find out about all these needs? And I really didn't have an answer for him other than our members who have hearts for people. And people know uh, that Cross Community helps people. And so people in need of help, they come to us. And that's really a testament uh, to you and your hearts and uh, obviously to the generosity that you share. Uh, So God is using us here and then abroad. A couple weeks ago, we had Antonio Correa. He's a pastor in Venezuela. I don't know if you know about their population there, but about 80% of people uh, in his community, they subsist on some rice and a little bit of beans every day. And so we're able to partner with them. Uh, We help provide them a facility, uh, help pay for Antonio to live. Uh, We recently uh, helped them get an air conditioner in their children's area because I want you all to think about this. Tropical area and no air conditioning, right? Uh, It was hard for them to get children's workers. So things have improved since they got air conditioning. Uh, But we're able to be a blessing to them. And so I want to say thank you once again for giving. It's uh, really, for me, to be known in our community as a church who gives and meets needs, uh, Man, that's a blessing. Like, that's who we want to be. Um, Today, I want to talk to you about something else that I want to be true of us as a church. Uh, Another thing that I wish and I hope for that God could do in us and through us, and that is that in the same way that we're known for being a giving church, uh, we would be known for being a sharing church. And I mean, uh, known for sharing the gospel. I have an image I want to start with today. Uh, You may be familiar with this image. This is a dandelion. And so if you are an adult, this is something you do not like, right? They grow up in your yard. They grow faster than anything else. They sick up. And then, of course, you know how they spread and they take over. And so if you're an adult, you don't like them. But if you remember when you were a kid, dandelions are pretty awesome, right? I remember walking through my parents' yard or the neighbor's yard, wherever I would find myself, and I would find the biggest, tallest, fluffiest dandelions I could find. And I would, of course, take a big, deep breath, and then I would blow those little seeds all over and kind of watch them as they, they floated on the wind. They were awesome to me, you know, like they were, they were a lot of fun as a kid, and I didn't really recognize that I might be spreading weeds all over my neighbor's yards, but I was having a, a pretty good time. The thing about the dandelion is it's in their nature to spread and to multiply. 
And what happens as uh, one dandelion grows up and matures and it, you know, puts those little seeds on and they blow in the wind, um, not all of them, but oftentimes those little seeds will land somewhere else and another dandelion will, will grow up and it'll begin to spread. And then it happens over and over and over until your whole neighborhood is full of dandelions, right? I say that because that's the vision that I have for our church that the gospel could be the same way because I believe that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is just like a dandelion. By nature, good news spreads, right? And that God wants to do an extraordinary work in our city or our community, our county, just like he's done as we walk through the book of Acts. I've had every single one of you in this room, you can think to somebody in your life, somebody who's suffering under the the pain of sin or addiction or brokenness. And maybe you live with this person And your heart is to see them saved and transformed by God, to see God do the thing in them, maybe that he's done in you. Maybe it's someone that you sit next to in school every day, or you work with, or you sit next to at your kids' ball games, and you just see the destructiveness of sin in their life. And God, would you do something in them? Just like the dandelion, I believe. Now, God is the one who saves, right? He is the author of salvation. He's the one who does the work, draws the hearts. He is the one who saves. But he has given us a role in that. And there's two reasons why the gospel doesn't spread as it comes to our part in that. The first reason is that Christians don't share. We have the greatest news in all of the world. But oftentimes for us, we get distracted, right? So many things going on in our lives and shuffling the kids here to there and all the things we have going, we lose sight of the thing that is most important, and that is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So in the same way that the dandelion never puts off its little seeds, it doesn't ever spread, I think the gospel is the same way. If we never share, it's not going to spread. Um, But there's another piece of this. Those little seeds that come from the dandelions, they have to hit the ground and take root and ultimately grow up. Um, They have to be received by the soil if they're going to to ultimately grow onto maturity. I think the second reason why the gospel doesn't spread is that sometimes we don't share it very well. I remember when I was at Oklahoma State, I would walk out of the physical science building in the middle of university, and uh, it was kind of entertaining. This was right uh, around lunchtime, so I would go get my lunch sometimes and sit and listen to a guy named Preacher Bob. And uh, Preacher Bob, was uh, he wore a suit every day, and he was out to let everyone know that they were going to hell. And so he would make up little songs about sorority girls, or if you were in athletics, he all, basically everyone was a sinner and was going to hell. And he was, at some point in there, he probably did uh, speak all of the truth of the gospel, but not before he profoundly offended every person around him. Like he wasn't loving, I don't know what his goal was. Uh, he was very, very off-putting. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can be the same as Christians. Maybe one of the reasons that it's more difficult for us to share is because people have heard from people like that. They think that when Christians come, they're going to get beat down with their sin. They're going to get clubbed over the head with the Bible, when in reality, we have the best news in the entire world that can change not just their today, but also their eternity. Today, I want to talk to you about how to share the gospel so that people will hear us. Now, we can't save, right? We, we can't just transform anyone's life. It's not up to us. It's merely our job to share. But today I want to talk to you about how to share so that people will hear. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 22. Before I get there, I want to remind you of what's happened so far in the book of Acts to see how the gospel has spread. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, thousands were saved, and more were being, being added to their number daily. Acts chapter 12, the word of God continued to increase and multiply. Acts chapter 13, the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. Acts chapter 19, the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. And wherever the gospel went, wherever the people of God went, they took the gospel with them and it took root and it began to multiply out from there. And that's what we long to see in our world. We long to see our homes transformed. Maybe it's your spouse or one of your kids. Maybe it's another family member, again, a coworker, or someone you go to school with. We long to see the gospel take root. So how do we share so that people will hear? This is Acts chapter 22. The Apostle Paul, as you kind of know what's happened if you've been following with us uh, throughout our Acts series, he's been headed toward Jerusalem. Um, and he ultimately made it there. He went out to the temple, and the people did not receive him well. Uh, The Apostle Paul, he went into the temple where they ultimately drug him out. The crowds turned against him. They drug him out of the temple, and they beat him and intended to kill him. 
it was only saved when a Roman official um, kind of overheard what was happening. And he came to Paul's rescue by arresting him and putting him in chains. Now, the crowd was so violent that even though Roman soldiers were present, they had to carry him out of the crowd to the official's barracks in order that he wouldn't be killed. Just inside the barracks, the apostle Paul says to this official, hey, can I at least give my defense to the crowd? The official grants him permission. And so the apostle Paul is standing on the steps of the barracks and he's addressing the crowd that had been beating him and intending to kill him. Uh, Just a note on the front end. The Apostle Paul shared the gospel in a harder situation than you or I will ever have to, right? I doubt that you'll ever find yourself in a situation where a crowd of hundreds or even thousands was trying to kill you. So just know the Apostle Paul, uh, he did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So whatever difficult circumstances you may be called to share the gospel in, they won't be as bad as Paul's, all right? So here he is on the steps of the barracks speaking the gospel to the crowd. Look what he, he says. He says, brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to, take, Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them into bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. So where the Apostle Paul begins today, the first thing that I want uh, to show you, how we share the gospel so that people will hear Number one, we begin by sharing our struggles to show our Savior. What the Apostle Paul essentially does is he talks about his life before Christ. And he stands before all of these Jews who are enraged that he's been in the temple. They think he's apostate. They're ready to beat him and even kill him. And he stands before those Jews and he's like, hey, I'm just like you. I've been where you've been. Um, I'm Paul. I'm from a city called Tarsus. I'm a Jew. I'm one of the Hebrews. I'm speaking in your language. I was zealous for God, trained under Gamaliel. And I thought that I had life figured out. I thought that I was on the path that God wanted me to be on. I was charging zealously forward. I was living it according to everything that you guys have been trying to live it. And everyone in the crowd would have thought, man, Paul was. He was killing it. He was on his way. They all would have celebrated what he was doing. Um, And yet the apostle Paul's heart would have been grieved by the path that he was on. The apostle Paul talked about being so zealous for God that he imprisoned men and women. He drug them off in front of their friends and their family. He stood and gave approval as Stephen was stoned. He persecuted the church. Now, the temptation for you or I, when we begin to share the gospel, when we want to um, be a witness for Jesus Christ, is to kind of put our best foot forward, right? You know, like, here's, here's my good side. Look at this, right? This is what, what God has done. Look at, look at what God has done to me. I'm now walking in victory. Uh, life is good. Marriage is great. Kids are doing well. We want to share that story. However, and many of us, when it comes to our pain or our weakness or our past, man, that's a part of our lives we just want to put away, right? We don't want to remember that. That's painful and it's shameful. I have a few questions for you. The first is, how will people know how great a Savior Jesus is if they don't know what he saved you from? How will they know how great a Savior Jesus is if they haven't known how much Jesus has saved people from. Now, the, the Apostle Paul is like, let me tell you who I was. I hated the way. I persecuted the way. I threw him in prison. This is the man that I was. He's honest about the, the, the mistakes that he made, the life that he lived before God. If all we show people is the part of us that we want them to see, how will they know that Jesus can save a sinner like them? Maybe better ask, If all they see is the best of us, how will they know that Jesus can save the worst of them? In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, the Apostle Paul, he writes to his protege, Timothy, and he says this. He says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is the message, right? The gospel. Jesus came to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. Now, why would God save the foremost of sinners? Well, Paul answers the question for us as we move forward. He said, but I receive mercy for this reason, 
that in me, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. We share our wounds to show our Savior. We let people know that we too are sinners, that we've been where they are, we've done what they've done, we've been addicted to the things they're addicted to, we have stepped in the holes that they've stepped in, and Jesus Christ saved us. That was the message of Paul to the Jewish people. I've been where you are, but Jesus Christ has done something different in me. And so what we do as the church of Jesus Christ is we just go and and let people, we go as an example to people of God's perfect patience. If God can save me, then God can save you. If God can deliver me, God can deliver you. We share our wounds to show people our Savior, the goodness of God, that God would look down from heaven on the foremost of sinners. God would look down from heaven on us. And when all we brought to the table was our sin, God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross that we might live. How do we share the gospel so that people will hear? We show our wounds so that we can share our Savior. Our mess, that past life that you might be ashamed of, God takes that and makes it our message. And we're a witness to people who have Struggle with the things that we struggle with. You know, people connect with us more in our weakness than they do our strengths. They might applaud us in our strengths. But most people who are sitting out there, most people are going to listen to, they feel like they're fatally broken. Like something's wrong with them, like they can't get it. And they need to know that that's where we were too. That we were hopeless and helpless apart from the gospel. And it's only by the grace of God that we have been saved and transformed and we're growing in righteousness. Now, if you're a man, you've probably done this at some point in your life. Ladies, you may have done this. I kind of doubt it. Uh, But I remember distinctly a few conversations when I was a kid where me and my buddies would get together and we would compare our scars. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this one was from the bike rack and, well, this one was from football. You know, I got tore up. Or this one was when I was climbing on the rocks and me and my friends, we would compare to see who had the, the coolest scars. And, you know, basically the guy with the most scars must have been the toughest in the room. He'd endured the most, right? Now, as believers, we don't, we don't just share our junk to see, you know, who has the greatest story to tell, who's been in the, the deepest pit. We share our wounds and we share our scars. We share our struggles and our weakness to show the goodness of our Savior to people that need it. Many people believe they're beyond hope. They're beyond saving. I've gone too far. I've done too many things. But when we share our story, when we show them the grace of God, And it provides them with hope that God is good. They hear the message that Jesus Christ is a greater Savior than they are a sinner. So we begin sharing our struggles to show our Savior. The second thing that we do is we share our but God moment. Look what the Apostle Paul says here in verse 6. Man, I've been a a, a Jew. I'm I'm from Tarsus. I'm a Hebrew. I, I mean, I was a Pharisee trained under Gamaliel. I was on my way. As a matter of fact, I was on my way to Damascus. Verse 6, as I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Possible. I was on, I thought I was killing it for the Lord. I was zealous for God. I was persecuting Christians. And then one day God showed up. He showed me that I wasn't actually moving toward God. I was moving away from him. I wasn't actually living like God wanted me to. I was persecuting Jesus Christ. Paul says, I was on my way to Damascus, but God showed up and everything changed. Read on here, verse 8. And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Paul, you're not seeking me. You're persecuting me. Now those who were with me, they saw the light and did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? Now something has changed here, right? Apostle Paul, who was going his own way, he thought his path was the path he wanted to be on, but he was actually opposing Christ. He's now submitting himself to God. What shall I do, Lord? Recognizing the divinity of Christ, that he is indeed Lord. 
And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by, the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. I was a good Jew, trained under Gamaliel, zealous for the things of God. I thought I had it all together, but God showed up one day on the road to Damascus and showed me that I was headed in the total wrong direction. This is our but God moment where we thought we were doing the best we could with our life. We were going according to the way we thought was best, and God showed up and changed everything for us. Uh, I grew up in this church, born here in Poto. I think I started here when I was five years old. Uh, I was raised in an amazing Christian family. Both of my parents were believers. They loved God. They showed me what it was to walk with God. They prayed for me. They prayed with me. They brought me to church faithfully. I had men and women in this church who invested in my life. If anybody had a chance to get it right and walk with God as you should, it was me. But I didn't. I rebelled against my parents. I rebelled against God. I went my own way. I hurt people in this church. There are people that I still see in this community. I look back upon some of the things that I did, and I still feel shame. Now, we've reconciled those things as far as I know now, but I'm ashamed of the things that I did. My freshman year of high school, I remember making plans with some of my friends to go get into some trouble. And I think it was a Tuesday night. There was the power team at the Bobbly Kids Civic Center sitting in a row of those metal chairs with the plastic seats, you know. My friends lined up. I'm watching guys bend steel bars and tear phone books in half, and I'm thinking, oh, gosh, what will the church come up with next, you know? And that night, I couldn't tell you a single word that the speaker said. That night, God spoke to me with clarity. And what he said to me was that the, re- the way I was walking, the path I was walking was the wrong path. And it was time to begin to follow him. And there that night, I surrendered my heart to Christ, like, fully. I remember weeping even in front of my friends. And God did something so profound in my heart that night. Listen, I was not there looking for God, but I realized that God was seeking after me. I didn't want to be at that place. I was making fun of some of the people on this stage, but God was still pursuing me. How much more reckless can you be before God than to mock his messengers? And that was me. And in that moment, Jesus Christ transformed my life. He transformed my heart. I remember in the, the, the following days, like literally like needing to pinch myself, like, is this for real? Because I didn't want to do the very things that I'd made plans to do with my friends. And I'm just like, what has God done with me? And I stand here today, and I'll, I'll just tell you, there is not an ounce of righteousness that belongs to me. That is by the grace of God and His grace alone. That is my story, man. That's how God has worked. And listen, there's a bunch of but God moments along the way, right? That might be the most significant for me. Uh, man, God did a profound thing in me, and He transformed my life. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, you too, if you're a believer here, you too, you have a but God moment where God intervened. You weren't looking for him. You weren't pursuing him, but God intervened, and he transformed your life. He brought you to faith in him. You heard the gospel that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He was raised on the third day that you and I might walk in a new life, not just now, but also for eternity with Christ. And God changed everything. The reason I call it the but God moment, there's a passage in Ephesians chapter 2 that we love around here. It says this, and you This is true of every single one of us, right? And you were dead in trespasses and sins. In in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. You weren't following God. You were following the enemy, right? That's who we were, dead in trespasses and sins, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, often being led by our flesh or desires of our body and our mind. And we were by nature children of wrath. We hadn't earned God's favor. And we hadn't, we hadn't like done good enough to balance out the scale of good deeds versus bad. No, we were objects of wrath, children of wrath. That's what we deserved. But in verse 4 it says, but God. 
being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. That is our message. I was going all the wrong way, following the prince of the power of the air. I was opposing Jesus, but God, who is rich in mercy, made me alive together with Christ. By grace, I have been saved. And that's our story. We share with people our but God moment, how God transformed us. It's not me and my own righteousness. It's the righteousness of God that has been credited to me. People love to hear our story about where we were before Christ, about how we met Jesus Christ. They love to hear how Jesus has transformed us. How do we share the gospel so that people will hear? We share our struggles to show our Savior. We share how, um, our but God moments. And the, the final thing here is we share how Jesus has transformed our lives. For me, I was literally shocked. Like, I don't want to go to the party. I don't want to go do the things anymore. Like God has done something. I don't recognize the guy I'm seeing in the mirror, right? That was God's story of transformation for me. For the Apostle Paul, look here in verses 12 through 16. It says, And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God, Elizabeth, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth, for you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And do you know what just happened here? The Apostle Paul, the former chief persecutor of the church, he just become the chief evangelist. God said, you are going to be my witness to everyone of what you have seen and heard. The man who once opposed Jesus, persecuted Jesus, opposed the church, is now um, fighting for Jesus Christ, carrying the gospel to difficult places, and building up the church of Jesus Christ. The Apostles Paul, if you think about his life before Christ and his life after, I, I think it's well explained in Luke chapter 18. This is a, uh, a story that Jesus told about a Pharisee and a tax collector who came to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee, he comes to the temple and he looks up to God and he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. You don't steal, not commit adultery, not swindling people out of their money. God, I thank you that I'm a pretty good guy, right? I thank you that I, I fast and I tithe, which is next level Christianity. Like, God, thank you that I'm not like other And most of all, God, thank you that I'm not like that tax collector. And then walks the the tax collector, the man that everyone knows is a sinner. Basically, to be called the tax collector in the first century would have meant that you are the, the chief of sinners. So the tax collector walks into the temple, and he won't even lift up his eyes to heaven. He said he beats his chest. He says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says, do you know which man walked away from the temple justified? It was the tax collector, not the one who was full of himself and his own self-righteousness. It's the man who was crying out to God for mercy. In the Apostle Paul, you see the man who was before, trained under Gamaliel, Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, zealous according to the law. But then he met Jesus, and on the other side of that was a humble man who called himself the chief of sinners, who went about sharing the gospel with people who were just like him, who were in desperate need of hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. We share how God has transformed our lives. And if your marriage has been broken and God has restored it, you make that mess your message. You share the glory of God of how he's rescued you. If your heart has been broken, if God has made you whole, you make that mess your message. You share how God has transformed your heart. I don't know what your issue was, but if God has healed that in your life, he has, he has restored you or renewed you, we give God the glory and the honor of praises. We share that story with other people and we invite them to trust Jesus in the same way, we, same way that we have. We share our wounds to show our Savior. 
We share with people our but God moment. We share how God has transformed us. And then we invite them to do the same. We invite them to trust in Jesus Christ. They might experience a transformed heart, a transformed life. They might experience the glory and the goodness of God. Like the dandelion, not every seed that we sow is going to take root and grow up and multiply and it's going to, you know, go to another place. But some of them will. And our God who came to save sinners has given us this charge that we go and we make disciples of men. And so we go and we share. And what my hope and my prayer is for our church is that the few hundred people who belong to this church and call it their home, that we would be faithful in sharing the gospel and that, that some of those would take root. And all across the city, in every neighborhood, on every block, that the gospel would take root there and it would grow up and mature and then it would begin to spread as the gospel should do. It's good news, right? And then over a few years that those seeds that have been um, rooted and maturing and beginning to spread, that they, they would then multiply themselves and that our seed our county, our country could be transformed by the power of the gospel. There are two reasons, at least on our end of the process, that God has called us to share two reasons why we don't see the gospel spreading. It's because we don't share it, or if we do, we don't share it well. Today, I've given you three ways to share the gospel of Jesus Christ well. Show your wounds to share your Savior. Share your but God moment with people. Talk about how God has transformed you and point them to Jesus Christ. My prayer that we see homes transform, marriages reconcile, and kids come to know Jesus Christ, schools beginning to be transformed. We are the hope of the world as a church of Jesus Christ. He has commissioned us to go and make disciples. So I want to challenge you. Go and share the gospel with people who desperately need to see it and watch what God does with a few seeds that you sow. Would you bow with me? Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for how Jesus absolutely um, pursued me when I wasn't pursuing him. God, for how you have changed my heart. God, for how you're patient with me even when I still fall and struggle. God, I thank you for the grace that you show. Lord, it is my heart, it is my prayer for our friends and our neighbors and our family members that they too could know the goodness of the gospel. Lord, we want to be faithful before you, and I pray that we would be a church who makes disciples. The gospel is constantly on our lips. Your praise is constantly on our lips. But our lives are lived for you. So, Lord, I just pray that you would have your way in our hearts. Make us a people who are faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen.